Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 158 for Monday, March 26th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and Welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, yes, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. Uh, you know, Paul, I, I know I'm in Durham, but I feel like maybe I'm on 10th Avenue because it is freezing in here today, right? Did you get that? That's a Springsteen reference, isn't it? I did get it. Okay, good. Yeah. Just checking. Because I think that's the first one I've thrown in in our many years of podcasting. You've put me back in my heels here. I, I don't exactly know how to re- respond to that. <laughs> maybe but what, is, what is the connection to 10th, oh, 10th, 10th Avenue, Avenue freeze, freeze out. out? Got it. See? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So anyway, my well done, heat, my well heat done, will sir. Come well on played. At some point, I'm sure. I'm confident. It's just not any time yet today. So there you go. <laughs> You're welcome to come to California, man. We've got we've got decent weather. I hear that. I know that. In fact, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, here here I and yet here I am. <laughs> despite despite the open arms that you and your uh, your your state brethren uh, always provide me. Do you take a, a typically take a winter warm weather retrieve? Like don't don't you and and Mrs. Hamilton do a fish in the in the Bahamas thing in the in the winter sometime? Yeah, so we 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 have for the uh, not this year but last year and the year before we did a uh, fishing trip. Maybe it was was it the year before? Or was it two years? I don't. I can't remember. But anyway, we did um, fish played in Mexico uh, down in, in Riviera Maya, and so we we went and and did that uh, in January a couple of years in a row, and then um, and then usually we but the fish didn't do that this year, so we didn't go. But and then usually we have a family vacation in February where we try to like duck down to Florida or something and visit family, but. Uh, my son is now on the varsity hockey team, which, yeah. means, which means there is no uh, February Life vacation time. Travel, yeah. Right? right. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's just how it goes with the kids and stuff. I mean, you just sort of roll with it and, and then, you know, and then suddenly they're gone and then you got to figure that out too. So. Hey, trust me. I lived through that three times. Right. 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 So. Yep. Yeah. It's crazy. So. So. Um, yeah. So we haven't really talked about gigs too much lately. Um, I had two interesting, two interesting privates, one on Friday, one on Saturday night with interesting tales from both of them. The Friday night gig was uh, in a not very big venue, um, a hall basically. And it was a a PTA event. And it was an event that um, it had, it had, loose organization and i'll get into that in a second but actually the one of the weirdest parts of this was when i showed up for the gig the person from the house so the the hall manager said i need you to sign something and i said i'm not i'm not the client and then no no no, this is something we need performers to sign i go okay so she takes me around she's very nice and she said so you're gonna read this and you're not gonna be very happy about it but we have to have it signed that's just part of the house policies and um this was this and, was like venue policy, not necessarily event organizer policy, right? Yeah. Gotcha. So she shares this piece of paper, and the piece of paper is, is basically a a warning about understanding playing by the rules with regards to, to sound decibels. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So the interesting thing was, she said, "You're not going to like it. I need to tell you, we rarely, if ever, have enforced it, but I have to have it signed." And so I read it and it says during the daytime sound cannot exceed 60 decibels after 6 PM cannot exceed 50 decibels. And I said, where I I said, we can't do that. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, you could, if it's 500 feet from the the closed door of the club. No, it's, 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 it's within the club, uh, the hall. And, um, and again, it's not a very big place. So this was a place that held maybe 150 people total. The event we were playing was for 80. And, uh, 
And I said, this can't happen. She goes, I know. I get it. I get it. Well, she goes, let me, we, we let have me, residential all around us. Let me give people a, a, a little bit of perspective here. Um, if you have 80 people in a room and you leave all of your gear and bandmates in the car, right? But there's just 80 people in the room. You will be in violation of this policy. That's correct. And right. she I understood mean, that. They'll, they'll be at, they'll be at like 75 decibels at work, like at the lowest. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So just so people understand that this is like, so that that's a starting point. I'm like, this right. can't happen. You know, <laughs> yep. before you goes, play a single note, you were in violation. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. And then it talked about the remedies and the remedies actually were, were pretty specific, you know, to the point of, um, you know, if you come and the police have to come and you don't turn down when we ask you to turn down, we can confiscate your equipment. What? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it got a little weird. And, you know, I was kind of like this place, like the, the, the person who hired us was, was privy to this conversation as well. And I said, well, listen, this is pretty stringent language. You know, here's the deal. If you come and tell us to turn down once or twice, you know, we'll turn down as much as possible. Um, but if we get to the point where the police are going to come, we're just going to stop playing. I mean, I'm just, Absolutely. I need to say that. Yeah, right. We're just going to stop and not get into this. And you, you the, can't you can't let this thing, you know, work through its process here. Right. Because, <laughs> you, 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 you know, want to go home with your gear. Yeah. Again, the woman from the venue, she had a job to do was to get my totally. signature on this piece of paper. Yep. Yeah. The person setting up their event, as I said, was already a little stressed about the details of, you know, their event was starting in a couple hours. I thought it was reasonably bad form not for us to know that this piece of paper was going to come until I walked into the into the door. But again, that's kind of loosey goosey stuff. This is not a corporate event. Yeah. Or that yeah. type of stuff. Right. Yeah. And, so, and, and, and who knows how it was explained to, if at all, explained, if to, at all. You, you know, explained to the people that hired you. So, yeah, I, I yeah. agree, though, like this is the kind of thing that they should say, we want to think about hiring your band. But there is this, you know, kind of crazy thing. What do you think? And you might say, yeah, no, thanks. I, yeah. So maybe, we actually got know. to the point yeah. where, you know, we're up on a good sized stage and, and uh, you know, but it's like a, it's like a, it's a hall with a stage in it. Right. It's mm -hmm. a, like a multi-purpose room. And, um, you know, we'd sound checked and, um, you know, we pretty much didn't have the horns, certainly not the brass, not the trumpets going through the PA, Sure, you know, a little bit of the low end, but, um, only vocals, nothing else going through the PA. And, you know, the guys, it was actually not a bad exercise in seeing how soft we could play. Yep. So there was actually some usefulness in this because, you know, we're a big band and we typically play in big places. And like, you know, we, we are a loud band. You're, you're and a really so, loud band on stage. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, this was literally like, guys, you want this type of work, you know, what can we do? And actually it no, wasn't a, a problem. A good, right. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. It, it was like, you know, the stated goal was right in front of us. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have to stop playing. We want to get paid. You know, what are we going to do? Bill was out there telling us what was sounded good, what sound, it didn't sound good. Um, I do have to say my, my in-ears have been coming along really well. So even though my guitar was not turned up very loud in the amp, he was giving it to me in my in ears and that's I could hear great. everything I needed to hear. And that's that was perfect. great. That's yeah, so that's one of those scenarios where in ears can really make a difference. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yep. So, yeah. So the first part of this was weird was this document we were being asked to sign. And that was just a strange start. So the evening, they, they're really nice. They, you know, they, the dinner is provided. They sent us over to a local restaurant you know, walking distance away, we go and have dinner. We come back. Uh, I was supposed to be downbeat at seven o'clock. People are kind of still just filing in. You know, I didn't get much of a lay of the land as to what their schedule for the evening was. I got a little bit of you're going to play and then we're going to make some announcements and, you know, that type of thing. But um, uh, uh, we get there and it's seven o'clock and it doesn't look like much is happening besides milling in and checking in. Yeah. And I ask one of the five organizers, you know, should we start? We're supposed to start at seven because they couldn't find the other ones. Yep. And this organizer said, yes, we get on stage, we play three songs, even at our moderately constrained volume, but it's still, you know, it's still a, it's still a, ba a rock band. band on stage. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. 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 And a different of the five organizers came over and said, Hey, why don't you guys take a break? We still got some stuff to do. We haven't eaten dinner yet. So I didn't know they were going to be so serving a full dinner. So we literally stopped. Yep. This is maybe seven fifteen, seven twenty, And we were on pause until about eight thirty, eight thirty five. 35. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then uh, we actually know we got on stage at eight forty five 
And then it actually went really well. You know, from 845, they were done with all their business. They interrupted us a couple of times to make some announcements, really just odd. Like another of the five uh, organizers would come up and ask us to cut the music so they can make an announcement. It was just, it was just one of those very loose goose and we just kind of went with it. Yeah. But whereas I thought after the first 20 minutes, when they asked us to take a break, that this was going to be a kind of a disaster thing. We just kind of let it flow. And then that last set, they had a good time and they danced and they came up and were very complimentary afterwards. And they really enjoyed, you know, the evening, but it just kind of suffered from a lack of, of thorough communication between the five people. And again, this was a, this was a, a private elementary school PTA type yeah. of thing. Right. So, no, you know, this is, you know, that it, it wasn't professional event organizers. That, uh, that 90 minute break, you took it, whatever, you know, seven fifteen, seven twenty. 20, that yeah. was the saving grace to this gig. It like, if you had somehow, if, if the instruction or request of you was not stop, but instead was, hey, can you play quieter for, you know, now because we're going to eat or whatever. But they didn't have the wherewithal to say, we think this should just stop completely. It would have ruined it because you guys would have been frustrated. The people would have been frustrated. They never, you know, chances are they never would have gotten up to dance at, you know, when they when they finally did. And the evening would have just petered out. People would have left. And, and that would have been that. So absolutely. I, it was a good exercise in professionalism. The guys yeah, in the band, totally. you know, even though they were amping to play and, you know, wanting to entertain and, you know, the starts and stops. You know, everybody just kind of held it together. And, you know, we've all done weddings where it's kind of like this, right? Yeah. Where it's like, you know, the, the grandma, the bride comes up and, you know, requests Sinatra and, and you know, all different types of things happen um, on these kind of like non-professionally produced gigs, right? Yep. Yep. Schedule. For sure. It's the schedule. Yeah. I, I mean, even as soon as you started describing it, I'm thinking, oh, I've been here before. And I, and I know you have too, you know, and like they don't actually want you to start at seven, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, cause they, they, they don't like when, when it's one of these social events and people are arriving and you know that they're going to want to chit chat for a little while. The last thing right. they want is a rock band trying to blow them out. And, and it can like, you know, like we we're saying, it can totally turn the evening sideways if that's what you wind up with. Because well, people, the conversation on stage was, should, yeah. you know, should we do our, our background music set, you know, should we do the, you know, the fake our way through some jazz things and that type of thing. And I don't think that would have solved the problem either. No. Cause there still would have been a certain le- you know, level. So, um, yeah, it, yeah, it was, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, like you said, a lesson in professionalism, man, like learning. Well, you got to keep your head. Yep. You got to remember you, you are the hired help. You're not, you know, you're not the center of everything. So Cog in the wheel. That's it. You yeah. are right. It's about them, not about you. And, and, uh, you know, again, they were, everyone was nice about it. I could sense that there might've been a little between the various organizers, the lack of communication, you know, and that's why events are, it's like, once you get to the event, all the stuff you didn't think of starts becoming very apparent. Yeah. And, and then there's a little pressure because everybody's showing up and all that type of thing. But, but at the end it was a, it was fun, but that lesson in professionalism, you know, what, what can you take from it? A lesson in, you know, going with the flow, you know, we certainly learned a lesson about, about revisiting our volume capabilities and what we could do at different volumes. You know, that, that was a good, that's a good thing. My yeah. ears you know, coming back into play is a good thing. So, you know, you, there's something always to learn from every gig. There's always, there's always some upside to every crazy situation, it, it, whether it informs future situations or whatever it may be. There's always something to learn from a gig experience. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. We played, um, we had a fling fest on Friday night, which was interesting. It, it was sort of in terms of the way fling fests have come together. This one was not our idea and was organized very, very quickly uh, because it was uh, the there's a there's a thing. Again, it was like a school event. In fact, it was it was for what they call project graduation here, which is raising money for the graduating class and, you know, their their celebration, and whatever. And, uh, and so we did this, this thing and it was a fundraiser and it started to come together and it, and somebody had the idea, well, we should just organize it like a fling fest. It it just, it was just a lot of factors came together. These 
one of the women on the committee, she and her husband had just bought the club called the Stone Church where where we've done these before. And they were they started describing this event. And Lisa's like, you're describing Fling Fest. We should just like we have a formula. We can we can just, you know, put it into motion and then don't worry about it. Like that part will happen magically and the rest you can do whatever you want. So so that's what it was. And and it was great. We pulled a, a band of high school kids together. Um, you know, and, and kind of did the, the loose formula that we've done before, which is having kids play and then, and then adults play and that sort of thing. And, uh, and that part of it went fine. It was a little weird doing it on a Friday because the club has a pretty strong happy hour on Fridays that they don't have on Saturdays. So having a start, you know, in the, what, in what turns out to have been the middle of that happy hour was a little weird, but there was, you know, the time for the event and, and it was like, okay, well, this is when it has to happen. So we're just going to plow forward. And that part of it was fine. People were okay. It's a, it, you know, this, this place is a, has been a rock club for like 50 years or something, you know? So anybody that's in there is used to hearing music. It wasn't really a problem, but, um, but in terms of lessons learned, you know, we, we, uh, as fling, we had decided we're going to play a lot of tunes that we've never played before. Um, you know, we'd been working on some new stuff. So we'd added uh, a couple of grateful dead tunes. We added Bertha and, and shakedown street cause Burke's a big deadhead and, and, uh, he wanted to mix that up a little bit. So we threw those in and those were good. We played and she was by the talking heads. Uh, we added a bucket list. Cool tune. Yep. We added a bucket list item tune, which actually went really well. It squeezes tempted, um, this is something I've always thought Fling would do really well. And yeah, we do that. You do? We did that. Yeah. We did it once more time. Simon brought it in. Yeah. You know, it, it's actually, that's that's one of those songs, man. It's, it's a very um, simple. Yep. It's a, it's, but it's a delicate, it's yes. a delicate groove. And actually there's a lot of changes. There's a lot of guitar changes in those, that. So the changes are crazy. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll, beautiful I, song. In though. fact, I'll put a video up um, that Russ had found of, uh, uh, Glenn Tilbrook talking someone else through the changes of that tune. And it's, oh, that's it's, cool. It's yeah. It was just a really cool kind of thing. You know, the guy's like, well, there's a lot of chords there. Can I just play like GCD and Tilbrook looks at him? And says, oh, <laughs> no. Yeah. And then, and then proceeds to walk through this tune in beautiful fashion. It was really quite, it's, it's a beautiful video. Yeah. 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 But, um, it, you know, we, so we had it in our heads that we wanted to play some of these new tunes and some of them like those tunes go over well they get pe keep people dancing but there were a couple of tunes in there that were a little bit vanity tunes right you know i mean i i would actually call tempted a vanity tune but it has the added benefit of actually being a great tune that people will move to and and so that's cool um but uh, and, and no right and no and recognize yeah yeah so we added radio heads high and dry which people know mm. but tough tune at the wrong time of the night and we and then we also added 50 ways to leave your lover Somebody had brought it up and, and so it was so eclectic and so, yeah. And so I, uh, I actually learned to play it and sing it simultaneously. And so that was, that was sort of interesting, but, um, it, you know, we, we had the set going, we were like four songs in people are up and moving. And the next song on the list is Radiohead's high and dry. And Russ and I look at each other and he and I on stage can usually mind meld on this stuff. Like, like, no, that song's clearly the wrong song to play. <laughs> you know, if people are, if people were just sitting there and, and chilling out, like that's fine. But you know, if they're up and moving pine dry, is just going to sit them down. You know, it's, it's just how it's going to be. It's a shoegazer song. And it I, can't be a slow song. What's that? It's not a slow song. It, it, it did not work that way. No, not, not at that point in the gig, not five songs in, like people were just up and dancing. I don't think yeah. you can give them a slow song. I think you, so gotta, you didn't play, you didn't place it as a slow song correct. and you don't perceive it as a slow song. Correct. It. It, it, yeah. It could serve that purpose. If, if you'd just done, you know, five cookers and then that maybe, but literally people had just gotten up for the last maybe song and a half, you know, you, like that's, it's, that's a, it's a delicate time in the set and yeah. and i looked at it and i looked at russ and i'm thinking okay he's going to agree that you know we're just going to go with this and and, and we're going to you know we're going to go with the momentum and and pick something like a blister in the sun or something just to keep these people up and moving and um because it was all the all the moms that were up so it was like okay let's stay with the 80s this is going to be great no problem <laughs> yeah and russ looks at me he's like no let's stick with the set i think it'll be okay and and i said okay 
you know, fine. I trust his his feeling because he's up toward the front of the stage at this place. I'm, you know, I'm upstage quite a bit. And uh, and so it 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 fell flat. And what I what I should have realized that, you know, Russ is a big Radiohead fan and and this would have been our first time playing the song. And it, it was our first time playing it. And, you know, I think he had it in his head that he wanted to make sure we got this song out and, and played it. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I, I haven't had this conversation with him, but but I can see that happening. It happens to all of us. You know, you get ex- you, you pull something in, you get excited. I certainly felt that way about Tempted. Um, you know, I, I just knew it was going to you know be a great song for us and that sort of thing. And uh, and so I think that that bringing all those new songs into one gig in 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 one sense worked really well for us. There were a lot of people there that said, wow, this was great. You know, hearing so much different stuff out of you guys like that was cool. But it, you we lost sight for a split second of how to, you know, of, of, it was, again, the same kind of thing, like your guts telling you this. Follow your gut. You 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 know, you've been doing this for decades you know what's going to work right now and this ain't it. And then we did it anyway. And it was like, and it, it sort of soured the night in that sense for us, you know, kind of from there forward. Um, and we, we got people back up and, and stuff, but it took a while. It was the, the flow was just wrong. You know, that's just how it goes. Yeah. 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 Well, so that's, it's an interesting thing. Cause there are songs that are good songs but are hard to place songs and they're, they're often yeah. high and dry. Yeah. Is it one? Is it, you know, they're, they're good songs and people like them, but placing them is really hard when it comes to flow. High and dry is a good example of them. And tempted is a good example of them. Um, yeah. It's, it's, and they usually, they tend to be these kind of mid tempo things, right? right? They're not, right. they're not slow. They're not fast. They're not fast enough to be fast. Right. Yep. I mean, yep. you know, on this, on the spectrum of fast songs that once you get people moving, I don't know where, where do you put those songs? Do you, do you like, you really feel a need to express through the song, you know, do you put them in the very beginning of a show when you know, it's going to take a half hour of, of music before people, you know, get up and going a good example would have been if, if I would have continued playing that show Friday night, yeah. would that have been a good time to do it? Yeah, maybe. Um, right. I mean, and the, I think the problem is at least, especially for us is with a lot of these tunes, we have no experience with how they translate from us to a crowd. Right. I know these songs because I've heard them on the radio for, you know, decades. Uh, but, that's very different from how your band translates it and how it comes across, right? And and so, like you said, high and dry. I hadn't even thought of high and dry as being like that. That's not a mid tempo tune. That's a slow tune, right? But yeah, it, but and if could, you it, actually if you take it down just a hair, it's truly a, a slow tune. Yes, you so can actually could, make it a ballad. It could really be one of those buckle polishers where people are just you know like up and and it's it's. Um, it's like uh, Clapton's wonderful tonight. Right. You know, right. It, it could be that kind of a song, but we didn't like, I, I had no idea what it was going to be like when fling played it. it. You know, it was like, we got to find our groove with it and our comfort level and all of that. Uh, you know what song I'm struggling so it's with? Interesting. Yeah. What's is, that? is Sir Duke. I, 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 I have, so tell me your troubles. I may have an answer for you because I've, I struggled like crazy with that song for a long time. So, uh, it's just a song, you know, it's got, a, it's, it's a happy song and a bouncy song. Yes. But it's, it's a, it's truly a pop song and, uh, you know, the horns pop that, that signature line, which is pretty cool. Nick sings it great. I just always find that it's just a tough tempo. I mean, it's either something we play literally first song of the night where you could dance to it if you really wanted to, but I really find it really hard to place once the energy is kind of cruising. Yep. Um, so the problem with Sir Duke is the groove, right? Because it, you're, you're totally right. It's got that horn part that can pop people up out of their seats and it's got that melody that's, I mean, it's a, it's a great melody and, you, yeah. you know, right. I mean, it's like, I've got all those things, but the problem is the groove underneath it all, especially once the verses start, you know, like, da, 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 right. That's just four on the floor and it's cooking yeah. and people can move. And then the groove comes in and it's boom, 
but dum but dum but dum but dum right you know and and that if you're not if your drummer and your bass player aren't totally in sync on how they're going to deliver that tune and i say this having had to deal with it i'm not i'm not necessarily pointing at your drummer and bass player but i'm saying the drummer and bass player really need to decide if they're going to play it like the record or if they're going to make it a four on the floor thing and it's mm. way easier to have success if you just make it a four on the floor. Simplify thing. it. Yeah. Just like, dum, 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 you know, just like that. Forget about those, those pickups, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, you know, because that, if it's just a grace note, then it can work. But if you've got the drummer playing, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, you know, on the kick drum, that can really disrupt the groove unless it's done so perfectly and mixed. Yep. And that's a, so it's perfectly. a feel thing. It's a feel thing. So it's really easier to play that ghost note, maybe on a hi hat, you know, or on, um, on the snare drum or something and just let that kick drum pound out those four. That's, that's where I found we turned the corner when I was playing with, uh, with groove syndicate or ghetto fabulous, whatever the band was called at the time. Um, that's with what made that song turn the corner it was the bass player and I sat and it was like, all right, Jack, we got to like, this song's falling flat every time we hit the verse and here's what I think's going on. He's like, yep. And so we did, we just simplified it. And then, you know what? Like nobody in the, else in the band even noticed anything had changed except they said, oh, that song's killing now. We really uh, got that yep. together. It's like, yeah, we do. We have it together. Exactly. Yeah. They, this brings up an interesting conversation about how oftentimes the part in the original version of the song mm. is really not recreatable. And I, you may be able to technically recreate it. But there's so much mojo in the feel of something. So another one where, where we're trying to find our way through is is um, Shake Your Body by Michael Jackson. Shake Your Body Down. Yeah, that's a hard right? one, man. Yep. You, so, and you yeah, guys so, play that fast, right? I think I played that with you at that gig, at that, yep. like those gigs. You guys do it really fast. So, yeah. So Russ played, excuse me, Joe played it as a, as four on the floor. Yes. And, and it was actually successful. And Russ actually plays the part, which is a really involved drum part. Super you know, you, involved. You, hands moving all over the place, right? <laughs> and, uh, and it's interesting because Nick, who plays the keyboard part and sings it, he loves what Russ is doing with it. You know, it's the feel that Nick knows. Steve actually said he's having not a hard time, but he actually, he's not feeling it. Right. Yep. He, he actually said he doesn't like the jump part, which is, you know, weird. But, um, but to me, th what the conversation really is about is about the translation of a feel. Yeah. Again, you can technically play the right notes, play the right parts, play the right drums, but there's a whole lot of real estate in covering the mojo of it. And it, it, because you're playing the right stuff doesn't mean you're getting the right stuff out of the song. No. And sometimes it is just better to simplify a song. Your audience will know it and they're, they're not necessarily going to. So, so, so those two songs, you know, Russ can handle just about anything we've thrown at him. And I mean, and he's, he's digging in and he's doing his homework and he's got the chops Sure, and it's great. Um, I don't know that, what, that, where we're, as a drummer that, that has worked hard to be the guy that has chops to be able to play nearly anything. And I mean, I can't play any, everything, but you know, I'm, I, it, you know, there's, there's a sense of pride of, of I'm going to listen to that tune and I am going to cop that drum feel. Right. And, or that drum part. And that, you know, can, can actually be uh, for me, especially I've found it can be my downfall on some tunes. And, you know, mm. Sir Duke's a great example of that where, it's like, you know, you learn the, the exact right part, but it just doesn't translate. And and you've got to simplify to make it easier. And so that's where, you know, seeing the greater goal is is. Well, it's, is it's the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. And again, yeah. you, I'm not saying that that it's a chops thing. And no, it, I'm actually not even not. saying it's a mojo thing necessarily. It's largely a mojo thing. But you're right. It's often, especially when you're going off a studio recording. Yeah. It's often a mix thing and it's often, a, you know, a, a production right. thing. It's a production thing. Yeah. Like somebody can sit in the studio and, and, and set that bass drum versus that, that, you know, bass guitar in the mix perfectly. And these days, not probably not with Sir Duke, but certainly these days you can even adjust the notes so that everybody's hitting exactly in the right spot and you can create that pocket. 
And, you know, sometimes that's not what you need. You, you know, or they, live, you can't, you don't get that. Like, it's, right. you know, your, your mixes are compared to the studio where you've got razor, you know, the, the, the razor's edge there. You've got mittens on mixing live. And I don't yeah, say yeah. any, this is not a, a you know, like I, I have utmost respect for every sound engineer I've worked with. And but they can't do it. You, I mean, when I've been a sound engineer, I can't do exacting things live. It's like, you know, you're just you're trying to wrangle cats. It's just get it all in the same box. And hopefully there's some musicality to it. And that's and you have to know when, it, when you you have to be willing to know when to give up the ghost. Mm-hmm. You have to like really look at it. You know, the, the, the proof of the of the pudding is what happens on the, on the floor, right? On the dance you know, so. floor, especially with songs like that. Like, frankly, that's easier than trying to, to say, play roundabout where people are never going to dance. Right. So, right. so like you don't have that real time feedback of, ah, I'm sucking this one up. Gotcha. You know, like I need to fix it so that people's butts start moving. Like that's yeah. a, that's a really good litmus test. Yeah. Yeah. So that whole idea is that, you know, the letter of the law versus the, what is the essence of what you're trying to get to? That's and then you have to recreate it exactly as it is. And and how do you evaluate whether it's working for you or not? That's, that's the, ultimately how's it working for you is what the question is. Yeah. How's it working out? I remember years ago, uh, I was talking to a guitar player, friend of mine, this guy named Ron Marks, who lived in Austin, played in a popular band there. Had played in cover bands. I, you know, he he did stints of his life where he was playing, you know, seven nights a week in a cover band in a you know tourist town and that kind of thing. And I remember him saying, "Oh yeah, you know, I got picked up to like sub for this gig or whatever, and I need to learn all these tunes." And he said, "But you know, it's easy. You just listen to the song." He says, "I don't even listen to the guitar part. I just listen to the song, and I pick out the things that I hear." And those are the riffs that I'll learn note for note. Like, you know, sometimes there's a, there's a, 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 like a lead that, that, you know, leads into the tune or whatever it is, you know, like if you're going to play burning for you by blue oyster cult, right. You got to play that guitar lead in the beginning if you're the the guitar player. Right. But in terms of what you play in the verses, man, like if you just listen to that song, probably very little in the verses, you know, because it's just open. It's required. Yeah. yeah. And then and then the chorus comes in and, and that song's sort of backwards, right? Because the chorus and the verses are, are sort of reversed in terms of general feel. But the, the chorus comes in and it tightens up and the guitar gets a little chunky. It's like, okay, perfect. Play something chunky. Like it doesn't have to be exact. Even and I actually though, think that's, that's like where the, the art of too. putting a, that's the art of where a cover band you know, yes. finds its oh, groove. It's like definitely. what you do with that information is like, right. if you're, you know, if you are dedicated to note for note representations, you better figure out if you can get the mojo captured as well, because you're going to, you're going to run into this quite often, but really what makes a cover band pretty interesting is, um, is, you know, what they do in the space between, you know, what, That's in the right. place where they can imply that. And also it's like, what is your, what is your gear? You know, what, what do you sound like? You know, and, and how do you, how do you get the whole thing together to make it work best for your particular setup? So your, your instrumentation, your, your instrumentation in terms of what you're playing and then what you're playing through. So your gear, how well can you represent something? How much do you get your sound and post of things? That's right. That, 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 that's a cool stuff to solve. That, that It is, but, but it takes an awareness of, you know, what you're working with. And that comes all the way from your you know, your personal skill set, but like you said, your gear, your PA gear, what your other bandmates have, like, you know, do you have a keyboard player? No. Okay. Well, then how are we going to make that tune that needs a keyboard player to, you know, to, to work on the record? How are we going to translate that? And, and like you said, to me, that's where the talent of, and the, the sort of the relative quality of cover bands comes from that, the ability to do it, but also the awareness to know what it is you can do. And, and sometimes it means simplifying, even though perhaps technically speaking, you know, you don't have to simplify it. Like, right. Russ is great at playing the, the drum part from Sir Duke he is well within his capabilities, but four on the floor might work better for that song with that band and that audience. And you know, what? that's it. That's that band. Okay. That band, that sound system, that production, that yeah, audience. That's it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, it takes the, when you're 17, 
I, and I, I, again, I project, but really, you know, this is just turning it in. When mm. I was 17, really hard for me to swallow that pill. You right. Know, and now that I'm in my 40s, really easy to swallow that pill. Yeah. Well, because I've seen it, you know, I've seen the result of doing it both ways. And it's like, oh, right. Success is the goal, not Dave knows that Dave played exactly the right drum part and no one else either knows or cares. <laughs> wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom comes with age, my yeah, friend. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, I want to talk. I want to take a minute and talk about our sponsor, if that's all right with you, Mr. Mr. Ken. Please do. Please do. Uh, TuneLicensing.com is our sponsor for this episode. And what they do is they take care of when you figured out the way that you're going to play your cover songs and perhaps you want to release your take on those on CD or on flash drives or put them on YouTube, whatever you want to make sure you have the rights to be able to sell those things at your gigs and you're not going to get shut down mm -hmm. just because you didn't go and talk to the right lawyer at the right place. And you really don't even want to have to talk to lawyers and deal with all that. That's what tune licensing does, right? They understand not only the importance of licensing, but how to do it exactly the right way. And they understand the difference between a performance license and a master license and a sync, sync license and a mechanical license. And they'll take what you're doing and go and make sure that you are fully legal and, and fully compliant with what you need to do so that when you release this stuff, you're golden. You don't ever have to look in the rearview mirror. You don't ever have to worry about, oh, crap, like we happened. We just sold a thousand CDs like you, you don't want to be sweating about that. Is somebody going to come and ask for money? No, because you already paid the money and you did it through tunelicensing.com. They, make, they make it so easy. They, I mean, the site is beautiful and they just make it so easy. It's true. Yeah. Well, because they know they know that you don't want that headache. Right. You just want to do what you do. So go, you go to tunelicensing.com. You're going to pick what song you're doing and how you're going to do it and all this stuff. And. Then when you're at checkout, this is where it's good that, you know, Paul and Dave, because Paul and Dave are gig gab and the year is 2018. So at checkout, you enter gig gab 2018 and you save 15 percent off of your licensing fees. So can't beat that. Can't beat that. So check it out. And our sincere thanks to Tune Licensing for sponsoring this episode. All right, man. Well, where do we go from here? I got a couple of what? things. But go. go. Oh, you I, go. OK, so we you know, you and I uh, play in in rock bands, uh, but very uh, generally speaking, the, the band you play in is the House Rockers. It's your band. Um, you are the leader of that band. And and certainly you you guys, you know, all talk to each other and, and you listen to them and all of that. But but at the end, everybody understands you're the leader with Fling. That is not the case. There is no one default leader at any point in time. Someone might be sort of leading the charge on either a gig or a project or whatever. But but we're, you know, um, we're 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 a a non leader band. And um, and what that means is sometimes we'll wind up doing gigs that any one of us would never choose to do out of the gate. And and sometimes that can be interesting. And then, of course, sometimes it can, you know, be a disaster. Uh, and we try not to ever play the told you so card because that's that's not productive. That, not good that, for that, relationships. That's that wisdom yeah. thing, right? 17 yeah. versus mid 40s or, or older. Yeah. Um, and so we've got this gig coming up on on May 5th. Uh, we're internally calling it Flinko de Mayo, but I, I don't think we'll ever actually call it that uh, on the outside. Mike, our guitar player, belongs to this. It's like a social club, I guess. I don't know of a better way to describe it. And he's essentially going to rent this room for the night. We've got to do our own sound. We have to, it's a, it's a do your own everything. It's just basically a room. And his idea was it would be great to do an all original night. And so we're going to have a couple other bands play all original stuff. And I, I like, especially coming out of South by Southwest where I saw so many bands playing so much of their originals and occasionally maybe throwing a cover in here or there. Uh, you know, my inspiration for this is actually pretty high and I've, you know, I've, I've played with all original bands in the past and, and had some great success, like with the clam bake on the road. 
that was all that band was. And, and go figure in, in college was an all original band. And that's where I played some of my biggest gigs ever was with, cause you can, you can definitely get a bigger crowd for an all original gig than you can for a cover gig. If you, um, if you work the system and, and work, you know, work at it for years and build your following and cultivate your following and all of that, because you're the only one playing your songs. Right. So, so you can definitely, you know, build that bigger kind of like we mentioned those Roxy Roca guys uh, did, you know, on the, yep. on the last show and, and that's worked out well for them too. But so I'm like, I'm, I'm actually pretty bullish on the concept, but I never would have ever thought to do this it's like no uh, like i'll i'll always if, if if left to my own devices i just know how i am i will you know go for the the lower hanging fruit of just like nah let's just book something and we can throw in some originals and that's fine because actually flings originals are largely better than the cover tunes like we have some great great songwriters in the band um thankfully i don't have to ha shoulder any of that load but i just have to play <laughs> these great songs that these other guys write <laughs> but um but I, like, I'm, I'm excited about it, but it's, it's, I, I'm remembering how much work it is to do this all original thing. Cause you can't just say, come and hear your favorite songs. It's like, come and hear your favorite fling songs. And it's like, okay, well now we've got to start like trickling songs out and reminding people, yeah, we put together this EP and here's some songs and you know, that kind of thing. And so it's just getting that machine up and going for this, for this gig is, um, is going to be interesting. So. Um, and, and then just doing a gig where we have to, you know, all we get is four walls, right. And we have to do everything else is a lot of work. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to brain dump on you a little bit of yeah. a perspective on this. Yeah, that might ahead. be interesting. So, you know, over the past couple of years is I've started doing a few diverse things. So, so I did only the house rockers and my whole view of the world was, was, put everything into the house rockers. Sure. And, and um, then when some of the guys in the band, you know, f felt that they needed to do some other things, original music or, you know, yeah. jazz or whatever it might be. And I would be like, but dude, every night that you do that, that's a night you're not available to the house rockers. And so, you know, what, what is it? And, you know, they had their arguments. I, you know, I, I need to get this out of me. This is my original music is whatever it is. And so there was that. So, so after a while, you know, when I had to turn down some house rocker gigs because my band wasn't available, I was like, well, I don't want to sit home if I could be playing. So that's when I started doing uh, acoustic madness and this trio stuff. Yep. And that, that led to me doing some solo stuff. And about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, I started dawning on me that, that um, I'm being pretty successful in all three of these endeavors and that there's like a packaging and a marketing and a leveraging point of these things. And then, you know, remember I would go and I would do like PK and friends shows yeah. Yeah. and then I would do like the Springsteen tribute acoustic night. And so, and so I started to realize that I'm developing a reputation as someone who does interesting music things in a bunch of formats right? Different formats. And I was like, well, that's not a bad way that I would want people to look at me. So for the longest time, I wanted people to look at me as the leader of house rockers. That was the only way right. that I self perceived myself. So having invested in, and then it, it even dotted lines out to what we do here, Dave. Like, I think people know me as a guy who's a, uh, 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 an encourager of mu of good music things. Yep. Right. So, yep, sure. so I do them myself. I try to like support my friends who do them. I, you know, have an interest in the well being and success of, of other musicians. And that's not a bad personal brand to use a, a very recent uh, marketing term. But, um, but my thought is, is that if I was to, and the, the idea about me dabbling into something that's been really, really scary to me, which is original music for a long time, I actually think I've developed a big enough personal mail list and have enough goodwill through the other things I do that if I decided to go down that, that track and say, you know, I'm going to play for you some of my original music, I think people would have an interest now. Yeah knowing that I've, I've created this brand and environment where w what I do is interesting musical things in a variety of outlets and, a, and an original thing would be another one. And I actually think I'm approaching a place if I could get over my own you know, fears and, and insecurities. Well, that's the I'm approaching a place, yeah. Right. I'm approaching a place where I actually think I could 
at least get an audience for my music a couple times a year locally uh, and at least get that shit launched again. If, if I could get out of my own way about this stuff, but, yep. but, but that thought about you saying, you know, I would rather take the low hanging fruit versus, you know, do this stuff. I actually think, you know, there is a path to that, especially when you're out paying. If you look at it this way, when you're out playing covers, if you market the experience correctly and you do this well, like, you know, like I said, you always told me go out and meet your, your fans at, at breaks. Yeah. Sometimes you're establishing a trust. It's not so much about that. It's cover music or original music. It's that it's about music and, and that tonight and fun. Exactly. Yep. Tonight yep. I'm playing for you, you know, some, some cover dance music. That's the premise of why we're here. I'd like to tell you about another thing that I do. And if you like what I do there, you're probably going to like what I do here. I think that that's a really valid thing. And that might be a tactic that, that bands, you know, like your relationship with your brothers and fling is a really interesting one. You are together to explore together a bunch yeah. of musical avenues, right? That's right. Personal yeah. tastes, cover music and original music. Um, and so that, that to me is a really interesting thing, but I actually think that you've established, if you have an audience, you've established trust, and reputation, you can transfer that to your original music. Oh, I, I think that's true. Yeah, for sure. Your, your, your uh, comment that you have to get out, uh, we all have to get out of our own way uh, it, with this is, uh, of course, 100% true. And it's not, you know, as an aside, that's not just about music. That's everything. Like <laughs> any, any success that you haven't had is probably your fault, right? You just yeah. like, you know, it's, it's that whole thing of when you look back, are you happier about the risks you took or the risks you avoided? Right. You know, and, and this, this isn't that big of a risk either. Like to your point, you know, especially if you've established, established yourself, you've got something, but you can cultivate that too. And I think your a uh, comment about doing that with a mailing list. I, I was thinking about this yesterday. Like, you know, I used to be so good about not only sending out like fling gigs on mailers, but sending out just my own mailing list. Like, Hey, yeah. it's me, Dave. Here's these things I'm doing. And you know, it, it, there's certainly a point and there's been points when I'll send something out and it's like, Oh yeah. You know, you could see me play, you know, with fling, you could see me play acoustic with monkey fist. You could see me play drums in this theater show, which you won't see because I'm actually hidden backstage, but you should come see it anyway. You know, like all of that is just me. And, and there's a trust level there. Like I don't get involved in things that, uh, that aren't going to be fantastic, you know, yep. or, you know, that sort of a deal. And people learn to trust that. And in fact, I've had some people, I had somebody come up the other night. They're like, how come you stopped sending out those mailers? It's like, Oh, yeah, because life, you know, gets easy. And yeah. of course, but there, but it's not just that it's because it doesn't take that long to send out one of those mailers. It's like 20 minutes. You know, it, like, right. I can find 20 minutes everywhere, but it, it's that exposure of I'm putting this out there and none of it better suck, you, you know, because it's my like you said, my personal brand. But if you're yeah. not putting it out there, guess what? You have no personal brand. So you might so as well just put it out there. Yep. Absolutely. So you started the show with a, with a Springsteen reference. I'll, I'll bring us to a close with a good Springsteen reference. So, you know, Springsteen has this long career of playing live music and recording music. Some of it remarkably epic. He's now a best-selling author, you know, his autobiography yeah. did very well. And now he's on Broadway with the show. And when asked about it, he's made the reference that he looks at his career as a conversation with his audience, that he's gone through this this process with them. And it's all, it's all about a communication with a bunch of people who are vibing with what he brings to the table. Right. So, yep. you know, whatever it may be, his politics, his, his not politics, his view on, you know, on who we are as humans, that's the conversation. And he communicates that to you in, in several different channels. That really is the opportunity we all have as musicians is like somebody out there needs what we have and wants what we have. Yeah. And so, you know, you may be playing some cover tunes so they can dance to some stuff one night. But if you've written this incredibly dark, personal, you know, unique, melodic, dark, melodic stuff, that is what you had to get out of you. If they trust that you are invested in the quality of their entertainment experience in one way, I think it's pretty likely that you can get them to trust 
uh, it, it, another channel that you have for delivering a message to them. And I think people should take a lot more, a lot more pride in that that's actually what you've done. You've earned that, whether you've done it overtly because you've collected their email addresses or someone that you don't know their name, but you see them showing up at multiple, at multiple shows, you're probably getting through to them with your music in some way or another. I, th I, I think about my buddies, the Coffus brothers, you know, that we've talked yeah. about them. We had them on the show, yeah. you know, they are, they are emoting some wonderful stories and um, and they've got people buying into the story that they're telling. And that once you recognize that that's the nature of the relationship you have between the consumer of your of your art and you as the producer of your art, that that you can transfer the genres or the styles or those types of things once that trust is established. And I think uh, that's that's the recognition most people should have is like I might play for you solo acoustic and tell you some stories tonight. I might play for you with a 10 piece band. I might play for you with a three piece, you know, harmony show. But one thing I can promise you is if you come, I will give it everything I have every night to make it an enjoyable experience for you. That's it. Once you can establish that and mind that, I think you can do what you want with your music. I think that's it. That's, I, that's very well said, my friend. Yeah. And that's it is making sure like th when you're on stage, your job is to do that and make it clear that you're doing that without overdoing it and, and you know find your own home and there's find a, your own home there's a million different ways to communicate yourself on stage i mean you can look at a band like like oasis right that does it literally didn't move and somehow still could capture hundreds of thousands of people that came to see them and then you, you know you look at somebody like mick jagger right who's all over the stage and he's a maniac but but it's it's honest Right. In both cases, Honest. It's, it's, it's their truth. It's yeah, it's a big mix of showman. OK, but that like but that's, that's his, his truth. Thing. That's who he is. That's right. Yes, exactly. And any, but again, if any you think about okay. Nick, yeah. if, if, if you, you know, if you heard Mick was going to take a new style, if you truly are vibing with what he's about, yep. you, you would probably trust that you want to check it out. That doesn't always go right. And again, this isn't like, you know, this oh, is no. life. There's going to be bumps. But, you know, you probably if you stay true to your truth. Yep. Uh, you know, you, you, you probably get, you get kudos for trying. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Even if it falls flat, people will likely see, okay, well, you know, it's still Paul, it's still Dave doing this thing that, that, you know, pouring all, you know, leaving it all on the stage. And that's really, that's maybe Absolutely. that's, maybe that's where we leave it. I don't know. That's it, man. Yeah. Well, that's all I got for today, man. You? All right. We're, we're philosophers, brother. We are. That's what we do. It's fun. It's good. Thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for sponsoring this episode. TuneLicensing.com. GigGab 2018. Visit us on Facebook. We're still over there. GigGabPodcast.com slash Facebook. Uh, what's that thing we say? Always be performing, Dave. Always. That's it. Because that's what we do. <laughs> 